Hello, everybody. Uh, depending on your time zone, good afternoon or good evening. I'm Patricia Osage. I'm the Executive Director of Life Elder Care, and we are a nonprofit providing free home and community community based services to low income elders. We are so excited to welcome all of you to this panel on the rarely discussed topic of ageism. I first have to give a shout out to our generous and visionary sponsors who include the Washington Hospital Healthcare Foundation, Fremont Bank, Alameda County Supervisors, Haggerty, Valle and Miley, and the Fremont Morning Rotary. Many, many thanks to them for supporting our work. Uh, and of course, we have to do a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, you can enter your questions throughout the presentations as they occur to you. Um, but we will address them directly following the presentations. And um, many of us are used to using chat. Don't use chat today. Use the um, enter all your questions into the Q&A section, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will certainly try to get to as many questions as possible in the time we have today. And I promise if we don't get to yours, we'll follow up by email next week. And we're also recording the webinar and we'll make that available to all of you as well. All right, now for the fun part, I get to introduce our panelists. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce all four up front so we can keep the flow going between their times. And I'm only gonna touch on the highlights because if I start listing all their accomplishments, uh, that could take up half the session. Um, first up is Josh Kornbluth. He is the one that's gonna share the secret of how to live seven years longer. So you get that bonus up front. Uh, Josh is a fellow at the Global Brain Health Institute based at UCSF. He creates and performs videos about brain science and social justice, which you can check out at citizenbrain.org. After Josh, you'll meet Ashton Applewhite, who you may have seen on the TED stage and who has also spoken to the United Nations on the topic of ageism. Ashton is the author of the book entitled This Chair Rocks, emphasis mine, uh, a manifesto against ageism. Next, joining us from the great Midwest is Professor Evelyn Reynolds, who holds her master's in sociology and teaches at Parkland College in Champaign-Urbana. Evelyn founded the Black Lives Matter chapter there back in 2015 and is one of the country's emerging foremost experts on the intersection, intersection of racism and ageism. And last, but certainly not least, our fourth panelist is part of the Life Elder Care family. It's Tony Lewis. He's a former counselor at the California Department of Rehabilitation. And Tony is gonna to share direct and personal insight into what it is like to be disabled, black and aging and what keeps him thriving. Our amazing moderator today will be Donna Griggs Murphy, who I've had the good fortune of knowing, I don't know, 12, maybe 15 years a while. Donna is a longtime advocate in all matters of aging and is a member of the Alameda County Aging Commission. Now I'm pleased to turn it over to Donna. Thank you so much, Patricia. I am so honored to be introducing and moderating this incredible panel today on the most important topic, which is ageism. Um, it is important for us to be discussing it and to be having this open forum. And we have these incredible panelists who are going to give some insight today. We're going to start with Josh. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, Josh. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so I have been for the past few years a fellow at the Global Brain Health Institute, which is based at UCSF. And basically, I'm a person who knew nothing about anything. And then they brought in to teach me stuff and mostly stuff about the brain. Uh, but then while I've been doing that, I've also been learning about related issues because it's based at the Memory and Aging Center. And so I just have some notes, uh, some stuff that I have learned about ageism and aging and that I can share with you. And then uh, also want to say you're in for a treat with Ashton Applewhite. Um, She's really terrific, and she, so if, if I'm terrible, you know, you, you have this to look forward to, uh, just right <laughs> after me, I think. So um, uh, one thing, uh, so yes, it's actually seven and a half years to your life. This blows my mind. Okay, there was a study, and it was done at Yale uh, by this professor, Becca Levy, and Yale rejected me, so I'm just slightly... 
Uh, I'm, I'm slightly nervous about relying on them, but Yale generally is pretty, pretty reliable. And they did a study where people lived seven and a half years longer on average. And all they did, all they did was think positively about aging. That's it. That was the difference between their group and a control group. So if you think positively about aging, according to this study, you, you, you live on an average seven and a half years longer. And that, that seems to me, you know, pretty cool. And also, you know, very cheap, you know, price-wise. Um, uh, let's see, oh yes. Uh, so I've learned, you know, the anti-aging creams apparently and all of those things uh, don't work apparently. Um, Although I will say that I, I use moisturizer and I, I find that I, I glow, but it doesn't make me look any younger. Uh, and, <laughs> and so I've learned about this delineation between aging and ageism that, you know, aging is uh, what we do. It's what we always do from the moment we're born. And it's very natural. And to be anti-aging is to resist reality. Uh, but ageism, ageism is something that we can resist. And I was really used to um, putting other things like racism, sexism, homophobia in the category of social justice. And since I've been reading about and learning about ageism, I, I've seen that um, ageism is a tremendous, uh, tremendous source of social uh, injustice. And, uh, and once I saw that it has to do with uh, treating people not with respect of taking away their dignity, um, of not giving them power, uh, it, I was like, oh yeah, this is actually an incredible social justice issue as well. So that, that just sort of inspired me more to fight it. Um, so a few other things I learned, I learned about the U-curve of happiness. I don't know if you've seen the U-curve of happiness, but it basically uh, when they've done these tests, it turns out that people are happiest early in their lives and then it really is unhappy in middle age, which tracks for me. And then it goes back up when you're older. So, so that's something that I just find hopeful is the U-curve of happiness. Um, we tend to get wiser as we age. Uh, this isn't true of every elected leader that I can think of, but in general, that's what we do. And, um, and I have learned from the brain folks at, uh, at, at, my, at the brain place that uh, essentially it's our semantic appraisal network, which you could call the wisdom network that gets stronger and stronger. And what it allows us to do as we get older, we get much better at delineating between what's important and what's not important. And just in case you wanna follow it in your brain map, it, it connects the uh, semantic appraisal network, connects the anterior temporal lobe, the orbitofrontal cor cortex and the amygdala. The amygdala, which is my favorite part of the brain because it sounds like it's Yiddish. Uh, <laughs> so that's really, I mean, there are other reasons. Um, Old age may old age was really important. It may have been responsible for the survival of the human race. Uh, only humans and a couple kinds of whales live many years past their uh, reproductive age. So why? And so the the grandparent hy hypothesis is that humans had th could have three generations living together because we had these longer lifespans beyond uh, reproduction. And so um, and and as a result, then the children that could be cared for while the parents went away. And, uh, and also that cultural knowledge got transmitted. So, you know, yay, old age. Um, uh, I'm, I'm working on this thing. Uh, it's like an epic sort of movie idea, but I haven't tried to get funding yet. But the idea is it's, someone, it's not someone in search of the fountain of youth, which is the usual thing, but actually the, the fountain of old age, which, which, uh, which if you think about all the positive things, you know, about getting older, you know, that seems like, I don't know, I think it'd be really exciting. And um, I was talking to my son and some other people about, I was learning all this stuff about how you get better at a lot of the things as you get older. And um, what I've been getting back from young people is, you know, wow, Josh, you know, being old sounds great. Uh, uh, how can I become an old person? And so for people who ask me that, my, my answer is generally to be patient uh, and, uh, and take good care of yourself. Um, let's see, it's the only, universal prejudice ageism in that it's the only one that all of us have a chance to be affected by. And then this really powerful point that I think I got from Ashton's book, uh, so um, which is that when we are biased against old people in general, that in a really powerful way, we're being biased against our future selves. So uh, this idea that we're sort of, that 
And, and so, so we hate this thing that we are to become, or we're biased against this thing that we are to become, and that creates this horrible energy of trying to fight against the thing that you're becoming. And so, uh, I just I, I find that really powerful. Um, uh, society misses out when old people are discriminated against because old people can do a lot of cool things. I'm counting on that. Um, and uh, there's there's some studies of about the blue zones, which is where people live the longest in the world, in those areas. And one, in, one of the things that went through all these different blue zones, which are around the world, in, in a, a connecting factor in people living longer, was that uh, having a sense of purpose is continuing to have a sense of purpose throughout their lives. Um, and so in general, uh, the idea, or what I'm gonna try to do is to treat my future self with the kind of kindness and empathy that I try to treat other people with as well. And uh, so it's really self, it's, it's self care as well as caring for others. Um, there's a list that uh, my mentor gave me, uh, eight keys to healthy aging, and they are uh, eating a healthy balanced diet, regular exercise, making social connections. Social connections are incredibly important. You're doing it right now, so it's fantastic. Uh, control blood pressure and cholesterol, uh, get regular sleep. Um, you're not supposed to smoke or do drugs, but I just feel like I'm, I'm talking to you from Berkeley, California, and it just seems hypocritical to say that about drugs, but you're not supposed to. And it's really great to be optimistic. It, it sort of goes along with feeling better about old age. Being optimistic is really good for your health. And then what's really, really, really good for your health is not to be ageist. So, um, that's some stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. <laughs> Self-care, that was the most important thing that you just said. <laughs> but I would like to throw it over to Ashton now for... Thank you. I'm, um, I'm frantically taking notes here because Josh was supposed to show the video instead of extemporizing and I was going to nail him on a whole bunch of points about it and now I can't, um, which was a little unfair, although he could have gotten back to me in the Q&A. Um, but I love his video. It's on his website. I'll post the link in the chat um, if someone else doesn't. And I love that he says um, all of us are aging all of the time. Um, we shouldn't try to fight aging and we can't, we can and should fight ageism. Exactly. A um, couple things he just said, thank you for giving me credit for the idea that ageism is prejudice against our future selves, but it's an idea. Todd Nelson was the first person who put it in writing. It's an idea that everyone arrives at if they think about this stuff long enough. And I love that you mentioned the idea that um, the most important component of a good old age, I, I, thought for sure. I knew nothing coming into this like you. Um, I thought it would be health. I thought it would be wealth. It's having a solid social network. So um, it's great that you have brought us all here together tonight. Um, uh, so uh, a couple of other points he made in, in the video you didn't see, uh, but in also what he just said, is that he framed the good news, this U-curve of happiness, which obtains across class, across culture, everywhere in terms, or adding seven and a half years to your life, in terms of thinking more positively about aging. In fairness, that's the way the, the scientist who conducted the study says it, that's Becca Levy, that's how journalists say it. I don't love that language because it sounds like happy talk and I'm no positive aging Pollyanna. It's not happy talk. These are findings based in solid social science or Josh wouldn't have quoted them. So I refer to them as fact, rather than fear-based attitudes. And they affect how our minds and bodies work at the cellular level. People with fact rather than fear-based attitudes not only live a lot longer, they, they walk faster, they heal quicker, they live better. My favorite study also by Becca Levy shows that people with fact rather than fear-based attitudes, I'm gonna condition you to say that before I'm done talking, is that they are less likely to develop dementia even if they have the gene that predisposes them to the disease. Now, I'm not Miss Happy Talk here. It is not that our fears about aging aren't legitimate. It's that they are way out of proportion 
to reality. And because we live in an ageist world, we often don't hear the other side of the story. And Alzheimer's is a good example. It's a terrible disease, but it is not typical of aging. We seldom hear the other side, which is that rates of Alzheimer's are declining fast. The odds of any of you listening to me right now getting diagnosed with Alzheimer's are getting lower and lower and people are getting diagnosed at later ages. And it's the anxiety that makes us more vulnerable to exactly what we fear. So learn about ageism and aging. Um, I was going to pick on Josh for an image in the video, which you see all over the place. It was two fit people about to jump on their bikes, um, older people, um, and head out, um, no doubt, for some epic bike ride. Um, these, no disrespect, Josh knows so much more about neuroscience and a million other things than I ever will. Those images are what you get if you search, do an image search for successful aging. Um, you know, people typically white shown with an opposite sex partner, wearing pastels, strikingly fit, doing things that require money and leisure. However, we age well not by avoiding chronic illness and impairment, but by adjusting to them. So it's really important to show olders with canes and wheelchairs alongside the people waltzing and people sitting in the porch swing alongside people running marathons. So I'm really glad that Tony following me uh, later in the panel will be talking about aging and disability because so much of our fear about aging is actually about how our minds and bodies might change as we move through life. And that's not ageism. That's ableism, prejudice against people with disabilities. And of course, plenty of younger people live with disability, plenty of olders do not. It is the belief that leading meaningful, desirable lives means staying youthful and able-bodied and able-minded. You know, we can all work as hard as we're able to to stay active and healthy, but no matter how lucky or how rich we happen to be, we cannot stay young. And, and, you know, why should aging well mean struggling to look and move like younger versions of ourselves? It's expensive, it pits us against each other, and it sets us up to fail. There's no right way to do it. There's no best way to get old. If you wake up in the morning, you are aging successfully. Um, one more point about in the video is that Josh says that thinking differently about aging doesn't involve doing anything difficult or unpleasant. That's true in, in the physical sense, but unlearning is really hard. And Josh also points out that we are bombarded by negative messages about aging from childhood on, right? What a tragedy it is to be disabled, how awful it is to grow old. And unless we stop to challenge these messages, they become part of our identity. No judgment, everyone is ageist but we can't challenge that bias unless we're aware of it and confronting the fact that we're biased is hard and unpleasant, but we can't challenge it unless we're aware of it. And once you start to see your own bias, then you start to see it in the world around you. And that is really liberating. Undoing ageism is gonna take nothing less than a mass movement like the 20th century movement, the women's movement, that catalyzed the mass shift of consciousness for women around the world. Culture change is slow, but it is real. Look how far we've come in gay and trans rights in just a few decades. Uh, look at the amazing um, you know, efforts of the Black Lives Matter movement just this summer to uh, wake people up to their own, our own internalized racism and what we can do about it. A global movement against ageism is underway. If you think I'm delusional, check out the campaigns section of this site called Old School, oldschool.info, which is a clearinghouse of free vetted anti-ageism resources. Everything's free except the books. Another free download on that site is Who Me Ageist, a guide to starting a consciousness raising group around age bias because consciousness raising is the tool that catalyzed the women's movement. We're about to put one up around the in intersection of ageism and racism, and I can't wait to get Evelyn's input on that. Um, why? Because we can't dismantle ageism without dismantling racism and ableism and sexism and homophobia and all the rest, because these are systems of oppression that feed on and depend on each other. But here's the good news. 
The, just, you know, a counterpoint to that is that so do different forms of activism. When we confront any prejudice, we chip away at the fear and ignorance that underlie them all. And of course, a better world in which to grow old is also a better world in which to be female, to be non-white, to be non-male, to be non-straight, to be non-rich. And I'm gonna wrap up with one more big idea, an antidote to the hand-wringing that usually accompanies uh, any story about aging. Population aging is a permanent, global demographic trend and a fundamental hallmark of human progress. It correlates with less war, with women's rights, uh, with higher levels of education. And again, it is going to be a huge challenge to scale up the support that longer lives will require. But let's tell both sides of the story. Josh referenced this, this um, idea, this grandmother hypothesis, it's called, that when a third generation, when humans, we weren't humans yet, I don't think. Josh helped me out on that one. Um, but we were lived long enough, homo, homo something or other, long enough to have a third living generation. And that is what enabled modern humans to flourish. That's when art and music came up. So now, right now, while we are all living four and even five, living generations are becoming commonplace. That's another tectonic shift, giving us the opportunity to tap into the skills and experience of millions more well-educated, healthier than ever before in human history adults. The biggest obstacle to making, taking advantage of these longer lives is ageism between our ears and in the world around us. So I hope you will join me in working to dismantle it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashton. That was incredible. We keep reminding ourselves to hear the words of not saying ageism and not repeating some of the negative stereotypes that we keep hearing. So now we get to hear from Evelyn. There you are. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so glad to be a part of this discussion today. Um, I'm going to talk a little about the intersections of aging and race. Um, there are many variables and factors that shape a person's aging experience, as we've um, come to know from our previous uh, speakers, but we can't overstate uh, the significance of one's racial classification on their aging process. Um, specifically, when we look at Black Americans or African Americans, research shows that they are disproportionately enduring ailments like diabetes, obesity, and are more susceptible to chronic illnesses like cancer, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease. And it's not only their susceptibility to disease, but also the fact that Black Americans are more likely to die from these conditions. So that connects to you know, access to health insurance, um, health professional bias, and many of the inequities that um, a lot of us are, are familiar with. Many illnesses and diseases have direct correlations with a person's levels of stress. So for Black Americans who are subjected to persistent racial oppression and the constant threat of racial violence, day-to-day -day life can be extremely stressful. For decades now, there have been numerous scholarly and popular literature on the implications of race for both racialized individuals and for society as a whole. However, there's very little academic research on the intersection of aging and race. Um, Patricia mentioned in our call yesterday that this is one of the first webinars on ageism. I think that that's shocking and needs to be addressed. The United States is just behind Japan and the growing number of aging and elderly members of our population. So policymakers and advocates should be attuned to the experiences of these individuals. If we can better understand the factors that influence the aging process, we can better accommodate specific segments of the population. We have to move away from this sort of white middle-class standard upon which we assess issues around aging and how we should resolve them. Not everyone can afford to move to Florida after retirement. However, if you look at most AARP magazines, the American Association of Retired Persons uh, magazines, and my classes look at these every semester, um, you might assume that indeed all retirees are moving to Florida. The average life expectancy in the United States is about 79 years old. Um, Black Americans have a life expectancy of about 75 years. 
78 for Black women and 72 years for Black men, according to the latest Center for Disease Control and Prevention data. We also know from the same source that police are now the sixth leading cause of death for young Black men. So when we're thinking about later life, particularly things like retirement age and access to retirement benefits, which is currently, you know, kind of set between 62 and 66 years, um, not only are most people not going to live much beyond 70 years in this country, but for a large amount of Black Americans, they're more likely to die before reaching that milestone. Retirement standards and mandates should be further explored and adapted to reflect the life expectancy of various groups. A long-term solution would be to address the systemic biases and discrimination that impact life outcomes. Since the start of COVID-19, nursing homes with Black and Latino residents have been twice more likely to have patients who suffer from the virus than nursing homes with predominantly white residents. It can't simply be the race of these individuals because as we all know, viruses do not discriminate, but people do. And it is racism carried out both systemically and through the actions of individuals that have made it so. I hope that these conversations will continue and that people will expand on the holes in research on the intersections of race and aging. In general, I believe that positive social change involves diverse and inclusive alternatives. It's pretty easy for most people to recognize the importance of supporting and caring for young people. But we're also indebted to the individuals who've worked and labored into old age. They deserve to be cared for and treated with dignity as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for those words. Our panelists are giving us some incredible thoughts and I'm hoping people are putting their Q&A questions into the Q&A section when we start having the um, questions. I want to move on to Tony. Is he here? I am here. Can you hear me? Hi, Tony. We can hear you. I, know, I, I don't think my video is working. Tony, your video is working. You might want to tilt the uh, your, your phone a little bit to your right. To the right? Yeah, just so we can see. There it. you are. There Beautiful. you are. Beautiful. Okay. All right. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Well, hello, everyone. I'm certainly very glad to be here. And I'm gonna just tell you a little bit briefly about myself. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, I am blind. And it was interesting, we had a little discussion before we got on um, the call where people were saying um, out loud how old they were when, when asked. <laughs> and I think that uh, it's the same thing. You know, one of the questions, first question that people always ask how much can you see? You mean you can't see anything? And so it's a routine that we go through all the time um, when trying to explain blindness. And um, so just like uh, many groups, uh, you embrace it, you know? So I tell people I am blind. And a lot of people even who have partial blindness say I'm blind just because, um, well, I don't know if it's a badge of honor, but it just kind of gets it out of the way. You know, it, it, cuts, it cuts to the chase. And what people see a lot of times isn't very good. Anyway, I went um, blind, completely blind when I was eight years old. And I did not go to school until I was seven because my parents did not believe that um, as a person who was blind, um, you know, as a kid who was blind, that I was going to be able to go to school. And uh, just... Uh, make a long story short, I did end up going to a, a school for the blind, which was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I learned Braille and um, how to do math and I got a good education and I went on to Temple University and et cetera, et cetera, and uh, started working and had a good, good working career. And now I'm retired. And um, thank God for that right now, I think. So, um, but being, being, blind or being disabled has a lot of challenges. I mean, similar, one of, one, of the, one of the things that you deal with as a person with a disability, and I think it spills over as, as we're having this ageism discussion, uh, as a person with a disability is asked all the time about their disability or they're dismissed or always looking for acceptance because what people see first is the cane or the walker or the wheelchair. 
or in my case, they see my dog. Uh, and I will show you the pit bull guide dog that I have uh, in a while here, so you'll get to see him. But they, they, um, that's, that's what they notice. They know all the, you know, they, they see all of this stuff and all of those things are barriers or, you know, really help to enhance the stigma at, in terms of who you are and, um, and, and the type of person you are. So it makes one feel less than. And I do believe that that's compounded uh, along the lines of race. Uh, I think that people who are uh, minorities, and I'll just say, you know, Black Americans, I think a lot of times when you go into a room, you know, how many times have people felt, you know, it's 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 interesting. Like my white colleagues would would go to. Um, I worked in Watts for a while, and uh, some of my colleagues, we you know, they go to Watts. We go to a meeting down there, and they'd go, "God, I was the only white person in the room," and it's like, well. You know, how many times was a black person the only black person in the room? Or how many times was I the only person who was blind in the room who could not see? And everybody had the ability to read uh, the handouts and um, et cetera, et cetera. And I would be able to, and I had to play catch up later on because I wasn't able to, to do that. So, um, but you know, we, you know, the world. No one ever said that life was fair, and so you learn to work around that. And I think that the advantage is of uh, when you do have a disability or growing up with a disability, you learn to work with that because you get it right away that the world isn't fair, especially if you're disabled and you also, you know, are a minority. You get you get that, and so you you start working working with it. Um, I. Um, have noted now, I, I meet many people now that I'm retired. Um, well, let's, let's just say, um, now that I'm retired, I meet many folks uh, uh, who are seniors. And I, and I notice that they're dealing with a lot of the things that we've dealt with all along in life. Uh, acceptance, you know, people seeing you differently now that you have gray hair or you don't move as fast, or maybe you don't think as clearly as you did before or whatever. Uh, they're dealing with the same things we've always dealt with as a person who was, who was blind. Um, I was really proud, I'll just as an aside, I saw recently the confirmation hearings of the uh, recent um, um, judge to the Supreme Court. And during her confirmation hearings, one of the folks who spoke for her was a woman who was blind, who was a lawyer, who was clerking for Clarence Thomas. And she was very eloquent and, um, you know, she, she talked in terms of how um, uh, the judge, Amy, uh, whatever her name was, uh, was very helpful in her getting all, all of her accommodations and so on and so forth. And politics aside, I just thought that was a very good representation for the country to see this young woman, well put together, uh, bright, blind, embracing it, reading Braille, and just, uh, you know, just really doing her job, just like anyone else would. So I think a lot of the times is that what people struggle for is opportunity. Uh, as a senior, I think that what happens a lot of times is that we, our folks struggle in terms of getting acceptance from family. Um, maybe people are used to seeing mom doing um, everything that she always did, running a household, going to work, um, um, just, you know, being the busy person who could multitask and do many different things and things have slowed down because this person can't see. Uh, I had a person uh, a while ago that I met who was very busy in her church and she got macular degeneration and she was steadily being taken off committees because of her macular degeneration because she couldn't see as well. Uh, very discouraging for her. And uh, I thought it was very insightful. So she went and spoke to the pastor about it and said that she was just feeling like she just wasn't needed anymore. 
And the pastor spoke to the issue from the pulpit and, and just really, you know, saying that what can we do to really, if we're really going to expand our community, we really have to mean it. And what can we do to make people really feel accepted and uh, to be a part of our community? And we have to, and that has to go along family lines too. Um, I'll just speak to blindness and there's so many things with disability, you know, if you're in a wheelchair or whatever, you're, you're, you're not and you're with me. Uh, you need training. Um, I use, like I said, I got a lot of training uh, using the white cane and I use braille and all that kind of thing. But there's different types of training that you can do. And mainly, I think the most powerful thing, I think even for us as people, uh, for black people or whatever, is that you just really have to develop a good peer support. When things go wrong, you have to be able to make that phone call to someone and say, God, I had a really crappy day today. Uh, this was awful. And you want somebody not to fix it, but just to really just hear it and uh, talk about it. And then it goes away once you, once you, 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 you express it. So that for me has been very valuable. Uh, after I'll just go, go back to uh, after leaving the School for the Blind. School for the Blind was really a good thing for me because I really didn't really know how different the world was going to be until I got out and I went to Temple and uh, went to school. I, then I really realized that I was blind and I was different and people just did, weren't going to accept me. Um, uh, people would not come up and talk to me uh, spontaneously or people would not engage me in a way uh, like they wanted to get to know me like they did, you know, when I was younger because, you know, I was in a setting where all things were equal. And so that was a big emotional shift for me to really learn that, that I was going to have to initiate a lot of this stuff to really um, uh, make it clear to people that I was okay with who I was. Even the times when I wasn't okay, you know, like my uh, lady friend used to say, fake it till you make it. Sometimes you just have to do that. You know, you just have to really power through. So there's a lot of powering through when you're different. When you walk into a room and you don't know where there's a chair in the room, where there's an empty chair. Uh, and, and, you know, so you're, you're always striving to be on time because you just don't want to get there late because then you have to make a big to-do about being late and, uh, and finding a chair and all those kinds of things. So learning to laugh at yourself and learning to laugh at your mistakes and uh, learning to forgive other people when they make mistakes, when they don't get it right. Um, it's all a part of it. And just being a teacher, and that's one of the most exhausting things about disability is always having to teach people what to do, what to say, how to interact with me. You know, you just don't always want to be a project. Um, and the reality is that that's just the way it's going to have to be. We're going to have to do a lot of education around that. Um, as I said, I have a guide dog and what one of the things that has bothered me, I don't see or I haven't ran into many, a lot of people who are who are blind, who are minority, who are black, who have a guide dog. A gu having a guide dog is a really big, uh, it, it, it helps a lot. It takes the heat off of you uh, as a person. You know, what people see is they see this wonderful animal and it does make a big difference. Uh, and, and I'm not quite sure what that's all about. That's one of my projects is that I really want to see more people who are blind in our community, uh, if they want, if they feel that it's something right for them to have the opportunity to have a dog. It's a great companion. And I don't think I could have got through this pandemic without my guide dog. Uh, my lady friend died right before the pandemic started, which was very tough. And she was blind also. And I'm very grateful to her that she encouraged me to, um, you know, to do this. Um, I, I, I get around really well um, just using a cane, but uh, this dog has really changed my life. I went on a hike with a group in Oregon last summer. We hiked this uh, trail called the Pacific Rim Trail, which was a very difficult one. We got lost 
separated from the group. And um, my puppy dog here really was very good at, um, you know, we, we walked seven miles until we found our group, which was really pretty amazing. And I will introduce you to him before I uh, sign off here. Jagger, up. Come here. Good up, boy. I don't know if you can see him, but that so this sweet. is my guide dog. This is Jagger, this very fierce pit bull Jagger. Um, you know, Jagger is a golden retriever, and he's really just very special, as you can see. He's one of the most gentle souls that one could imagine. Very grateful for him. And like I said, it really does... For one thing, he's a conversation starter. You know, we're, for, for once, we're not just talking about me. We're talking about, where'd you get this dog? You know, how does he help you? Or what, what you know? And it, it is just, it, it's just really pretty remarkable. And this is who he is. He's pretty chill. He's pretty right. chill. Right. But um, anyway, long story short, uh, what I would leave you with is, is this, is that uh, if you have a disability or you know somebody who's a dis who has a disability, uh, really encourage them to get some training. Also encourage them to get a peer group. Uh, I put some peer group, uh, some information for, for blindness related stuff uh, on the list. And if that's what's, what's, uh, if you know anybody uh, with that, then, you know, please take advantage of it. And also what I think is very important is that you just got to learn to laugh at yourself. And I will leave it at that for now and take some questions when you're ready. Thank you so much, Tony, for your incredible words, all of the panelists. Um, we have some questions that um, Patricia is going to be able to field from the Q&A. I guess we can still put them in there, like she said. Mm -hmm. Not able to get to them all. She will um, email you next week, and we'll respond as we can. Great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I have one that said, but getting old is really hard. How can I feel positive with my painful knees and less money? <laughs> I don't know what to take that one, Ashton, maybe, or Josh, or. You know, it, that's why I'm, I say that I'm not a positive aging Pollyanna. I don't like the whole, you know, successful aging or positive aging discourse, which implies that if you just eat enough kale or have the right attitude, everything's going to be fine. Because if you're super lucky, it is, and it sure helps to be well off, but we are all, you know, hostage to forces beyond our control, not least of all, um, which is, uh, is luck. And you know, only you know your own experience and whatever you experience is obviously completely authentic. What I try to get people to do in my work is to zoom out a bit and take a look at the larger source, social forces, you know, which I think Evelyn made the point about, about race and racism as a, as a factor of vulnerability around a lot of, um, you know, physical conditions. It, race older age is makes you more vulnerable to covid race should not racism does so think about the that point to, to which and, and i don't mean to make an equivalency between ageism and racism but think about how ageism meaning the social and economic forces that want to make you feel a certain way about aging and that do not have your best interests at heart how they might be playing into your feelings of um, unhappiness and, um, you know, being, being stuck in a situation. But, you know, that's not to disregard for an instant your own experience, which is, of course, 100% legit. Great. Thank you. Um, why do you think so many people don't understand when they are being ageist? What should we say so that we don't hurt their feelings? And, and I imagine this is, um, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, when, when somebody really is, uh, means very well when they say, you look so good for your age. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I guess they want to know, like, how how do we, you know, how what do we say not and don't hurt their feelings? Well, I, that you did ask me the one question for which I have a snappy answer after 15 years. Um, when someone says you look good for your age, if you can manage it, say with a straight face, you look good for your age, too. And that makes the person reflect on what, why, what they intended as a compliment doesn't feel like a compliment. And we don't want to put people on the defensive because that's just not helpful. But intentions do not get you off the hook. So, what, so and a good all-purpose rejoinder to an ageist comment is, um, you know, what do you mean by that? Right? <laughs> you know? And just make the, you know, are, are you still working? What do you mean by that? And without, without the snark, which is not always easy, but what we want to do is open the little space in the conversation for the person to reflect on wh why did they make that assumption and what's, what's it about? Because it's in that moment, that's what I meant about it being uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to force someone to go there and it's uncomfortable to be put in that position, but if we don't reflect on the ways in which we are ageist and racist and homophobic and all those things, nothing changes in our, in our mental set and our actions. And then of course we can't take that change out into the culture. Great. Um, this one I'm gonna give to Evelyn next. Um, what are some of the concrete things we can do uh, to spread the word about ageism combined with racism. Concrete things that we can do to spread the word. Um, I think conversations like we're having tonight, um, just thinking about things as connected um, and intersecting. And I mean, we all kind of live and experience these intersections all the time, being a woman of a certain social class or um, across a bunch of different identities and statuses and things like that. And so I think just being mindful of that um, all the time is a really helpful tool. Um, but I think we need to treat ageism as seriously as we treat racism and as seriously as we treat other isms. Um, and I, I don't think we do. And it's not brought up enough and it's not challenged and questioned enough. Um, and so that's why I think we're kind of still at this place in 2020 um, where it's okay, it's totally okay, you know, to make ageist jokes and we hear, hear them all the time in the media. Um, and so I think I really appreciated what um, was just said by Ashton, you know, just kind of throwing those questions back. And some of, for some of my own um, friends, when they have birthdays coming up and things like that, I'm like, oh, I'm getting older. And I'm like, you know, would you rather be dead or would you rather be getting older? <laughs> you know, and it's, I mean, it's just like basic things like that to really call out what you're doing because they don't notice sometimes the language that we're using and um, and the power uh, behind it and kind of um, you know the way that it, it sort of shapes our perceptions about things and so I think just being more mindful of language and there's a lot of writing actually um, I can't think of the author now I can find it in a second um, but there's some writings on um, looking at and thinking more about the language around disability and the language around like aging and things like that and really kind of training ourselves to think differently and talk differently and therefore act differently as well. So I think I was kind of going off on a tangent there, sorry, but hopefully I, <laughs> hopefully I somewhat answered the question. That's great, thank you. Uh, Josh, um, when does the U curve start going back up? <laughs> when, I'm sorry, when does the U, uh, you know, the, I, the U curve that I have uh, is, is not super specific. So uh, it just sort of goes like youth, middle age, old. And so, so um, but I'm just going to say just uh, when I was about 45, I got really down. So I'm going to, I'm going to put that there. I'm just, that's just totally, I'm just putting that for my own life. But um, actually, to be totally honest, my 20s and 30s were really bad too. So um, I think I don't have a U curve so much as just a general flat line of, of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that's helpful. Okay, great. Um, and then this might, this, is, this might be for you too. It's about the blue zone. Um, is there ageism in the blue zone? Were you the one who mentioned that? Yeah, blue I did zone? mention it, yeah. Yeah, is there, is there, uh, they want to know, is there ageism in the the blue zone, which uh, remind us what that was. The blue zones are uh, places that have been identified where people live really long, you know, we live really long lives, like 
I know I was sort of first aware of that sort of idea of uh, it tended to be like people who ate yogurt. <laughs> it's like there's a whole thing about <laughs> people who eat yogurt and, and uh, it might have been from the yogurt industry or whatever, but the, there are different regions and they're all around, they're all around the world. But um, I think as usual, I think for the actual factual answer, maybe I would pass it along to Ashton. <laughs> Great, Ashton. Um, the, the blue zones, there's Sardinia, Japan, they're, they're places where people live really long. I think the defining characteristic that they share is they are intergenerational communities. They're rural for the most part. They are, they're small, they're places where people, um, you know, uh, are exposed to people of all ages their entire life course. So people, you know, ha have a role in the community all the way along. And it, you know, again, the most important component of a good old age is a solid social network, is having a purpose. And when you live in a small community, you do, you know, you, you you're, you're, you preserve an identity within that community. So, and also they eat lots of olive oil and they walk up and down a lot of really steep hills. So that's good for you too. Great. Um, why doesn't the government care? It's mainly old people dying of COVID. <laughs> I don't know who wants to answer that or if there is an answer, but maybe they do. I don't know if it's, yeah, anyway. I uh, think just my, my experience is that in, in recent times that the government has shown not very much empathy for a whole group of bunch of people over a wide range. Uh, and that would fall under that category of not caring. It's probably ageism, perception. right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's yeah. elitism. I mean, their defining characteristic is that not that they are old white or male, not that I want to say anything in defense of old white men, but, um, you know, they are, hey. they, <laughs> you're not, <laughs> you're, you're not running government. It's that they can sort of buy their way out of problems that confront most of us. And they are, of course, ageist, ableist, and racist, um, like both of I saw somebody just write in the chat, population control. Sadly, it's true. <laughs> uh, um, okay, we have a couple more. Uh, does aging vary? Uh, does aging vary in various cultures? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, um, even thinking about like life expectancy, and that varies by different ethnic groups, and so many things do. You know, vary by ethnic groups, um, social class, and health, whether you have health insurance or not. I mean, you can see all of these different breakdowns by specific um, ethnic groups, and so there's certainly um, differences by uh, when it comes to aging as well. And along those lines, um, talking about the importance of social networks and, and being among uh, folks of different age groups, intergenerational communities, um, Asian Americans, for example, are the longest living group in the U.S. Um, and they also have fam familiar practices of living with, you know, parents and grandparents and taking care of their aging relatives and things like that. And so I think that um, is a good kind of um, connection to, to that discussion um, as well. And also highlighting a specific um, sort of difference or unique factor um, by ethnicity. So yeah, there's certainly lots of, lots of uh, differences. Great, great. Uh, Tony, I'm gonna, I'm gonna direct this question to you if I may, um, because, and this is this for me, uh, we see a lot of uh, elders who, uh, don't seem to have meaning in their lives and they do not have a support system like you do, how can they start um, start putting that behind them and finding meaning in their lives and finding people to call when they need to uh, and vent about their day? Um, I just wanna make sure I, I am unmuted, right? Yes. Okay. I, I think that again, I really think that uh, it's important to, uh, sometimes you have to make that connection for the person. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I was a rehabilitation counselor, we'd always get, uh, we would rarely get a call from the person who needed help. We would get a call from a family member or a friend or whatever. And that's usually how it works. And I just really think it's important whenever you can to make a peer connection. Um, with someone who can really, you know, speak to the issue 
um, when you're going, when you're losing your sight, um, uh, a lot of times, even when I met people on the phone for the first time, and I'd say, okay, you know, we're going to help you do this, this, and this. Uh, they would say, well, what do you know? You know, you can see. And I'd say, well, <laughs> when we meet, I think you're going to be surprised. Um, and then, you know, we we talk and then they'd find out that I was blind also. And I think that that was step number one in them getting back on their path. Knowing right. that a person who has, is in a similar situation as they are, could still have a quality of life. I remember once, so one of the most vivid things memories that I have was um, this really bright um, guy who was in law school and uh, he was Asian American and he came into the office with his father and his father was sobbing because, you know, he had all these high expectations for his son. Um, and I just said, you know, your, your son's going to be okay. Your son's smart. He's going to figure this out. He's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. And, um, you know, years later, and he was okay. He ended up being a, a programmer uh, for um, Bank of America, a computer programmer, totally blind, and he prog does programming for them. And he said, you know, he said he uh, thanked me for that. He said, I, I really wanted to thank you. I said, it meant a lot to my father, but it also meant a lot to me that you, you know, just re gave me that assurance that I was going to be okay. And, and he did say that it was the peer connection. He just said, just knowing yeah. somebody who was blind, who had that confidence, uh, really made a big difference. So I think cool. that that's really the big, uh, a big step whenever possible okay. um, All right. Thank to, you. to do that. Wonderful. So um, we only have five minutes. Um, so I, I really will get answers back to other questions. In this last five minutes, I would like each panelist to tell us one thing we can do briefly um, to uh, ameliorate and prevent uh, ageism. Josh, you wanna start? You're on my right. Okay, so there's so many things to pick. Um, but I think I'm gonna pick a thing and, and Tony uh, just alluded to it and others have as well, which is a social connection. Um, it is that I think there's, there's an idea that I think in the general population, this, this idea that when you get older, that you're sort of fading away from connecting with the rest of society. You've already, you've done your thing, you've done your time, and now this is the after time, you know? And, and so I think, and also as someone mentioned, the multi-generational, uh, I think Evelyn did, but the, the multi-generational connections um, just seem to be incredibly powerful, both for the older people and for the younger people. Uh, so, I would say uh, try to try to connect and connect along, uh, connect across uh, age groups. Thank you, Evelyn. One thing um, you want people to know that they can do to prevent ageism. It's a really hard one. <laughs> There's like so many things, um, and I mean, I was thinking the the, uh, the same as Josh just mentioned. Those intergenerational relationships are really really important, um, but also. It's kind of cliche, I guess, but education, reading more, expanding our horizons and perspectives and branching out and thinking about things differently and challenging ourselves, challenging our preconceived notions and the way we've always felt about things. You know, all of those sorts of things, I think just that constant sort of inner work that, um, that we need to do. Um, and just thinking about, you know, ageism in that, in that sort of way as we try to kind of self-improve when it comes to other, other areas of our life as well, whether it's working toward um, being less, you know, being anti-racist or being, you know, less capitalist or whatever it might be, yeah. um, but to also kind of challenge our way, ourself in that way when it comes to ageism as well. Wonderful. And then Tony, you, you already talked about the um, peer support as being key. Ashton, uh, what's your final thought on how to prevent ageism? Um, I would build on on both, um, well, on what things, things that everyone said, peer support, connection. Um, a, a, Josh mentioned, the, the, you know, the, the fountain of youth, we need the fountain of old. Um, um, Mark um, Friedman, who uh, started Encore and writes about this, talks, he says the fountain of youth is the fountain with youth. It's really, really important to make friends of all ages as a way for, you know, for a million intuitively obvious reasons. Sometimes I think that if I could beam one fact about aging into everyone's brains, it would be the fact that the longer we live, the more different from one another we become, the less our age says about what we're interested in, 
or capable of socially or physically, think of something you like to do and find a mixed age group to do it with. If you're really feeling ambitious, start a consciousness racing group. I posted a link in the chat channel, you know, and talk about this stuff because we don't talk about it that much. And it's, you know, it's incredibly interesting. Wonderful. I want to just mention one quick, quick thing. Absolutely. We have a president that's 78 years old. I think it's wonderful. I think it's great. And I don't know if you guys have observed what I've observed. I mean, Joe Biden, since he's uh, uh, been nominated, I think years have come off him, really. I mean, because I think there's something about being relevant. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, there's been so many Joe Biden jokes, and which is awful. But I, I think that he is the right person for this right time. And that's right. all I have to say about that. Thank you all. So I, I just want to give like another intense thank you to each one of our amazing panelists and our wonderful moderator, Donna, and to each one of you in the audience for really caring enough about this topic um, to, to spend time with us on it today. Um, so I'm going to borrow something from Kamala Harris. Um, this may be one of the first panels on ageism, but it won't be the last. So have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. <laughs>